Before we begin, I would like to emphasize that this podcast is separate from my teachings and work at Del Seton Medical Center. Any discussions we have on this podcast is for entertainment purposes only and in no way connected to Del Seton Medical Center. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Life of Flow. Today we had a great discussion with Scott Nelson. He's the CEO of the company Fastwave, and he'll give us a little bit of a, uh, I would say, tour de life here about where he started how he got to where he is and some of the future projects. I thought it was very entertaining and lots of uh, tips and tricks for you entrepreneurs out there. So tune in, Vamos. let's do it. Two vascular surgeons walk into a bar and come out with a podcast. We are talking everything vascular and not. Welcome to the Life of Flow podcast. We launched the site on a, on a whim in early 16 did a little bit of revenue that that year and kind of le learned a lot basically over the course of that that first year and then um you know circle circling around to like early 17 the business just started blowing blowing up just started taking off like a like a rocket ship where did you find the devices that you decided to start selling online In initially we tried to identify something that we could use off the shelf right that didn't require a ton of customization um, but that met certain quality standards and so you know, uh, initially went to Alibaba, actually, this was back in, again, kind of back in the back half of 2015 to figure out what manufacturers, if any, you know, we could potentially work with um, and leverage off the shelf uh, devices and with some, some, with some minor modifications versus wholesaling, you know, building a, um, a, 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 a custom product. Cause as you guys probably know, that's, that process is pretty intense from a capital perspective, as well as a, as well as a timeline. And we just wanted to see, is this thing going to work right before pour pouring, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars into it? Um, and I think that that's one of the key lessons for any anyone that's sort of that's listening that's sort of bent towards, you know, the world of of uh, of startups is try 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 to first determine if 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 you're going to have product market fit right before you throw too much at any certain project. That's the key. And if you can do that in a in a really lean and efficient way, that's phenomenal, right? Because you can just try a lot of things without wasting too much time or capital on any one thing before you know uh, there's there's traction. Um, and so, so yeah, just identified a you know sort of going back around to your question, Miguel, uh, identified a, a manufacturer, and that's what allowed you know. And we we tweaked and and modified an off the shelf device, and that was our that was our first version, right? That we commercialized on, online, and uh, and the company. I mean, just to, just to kind of uh, put it in perspective, the company. Um, took off like a rocket ship. So we went from, you know, zero, zero, you know, dollars in revenue, um, uh, to, you know, mid, mid $20 million in revenue within a few years, entirely online, uh, direct to consumer. Um, and so no, no other channels, no retail, no wholesale, uh, that was it. Um, and so, um, but that, I think, um, that's just a testament to like, you know, trying to try to trying a lot of things, right? Being curious and trying a lot of things and just getting, getting a, a, a number of reps in. Did you have any experience managing, you know, companies working the logistics, supply chains, anything like that, or did you just win? Yeah, I, I think my experience in um, in large strategics um, certainly helped to a, a certain extent, right? Uh, in a number of ways. Um, one is is I, I grew up kind of on, in in the commercial world and in, in sales and in marketing positions, so I think you know naturally I'm I'm, I'm decent at that. Um, but then inside a large strategic, if you're in a kind of a marketing capacity, a lot of times you're interacting with R and D. Uh, supply chain, quality, regs. So you get to touch a lot of different functions. And so um, um, so I think certainly that helped. But that experience with Jude was really the first, the first one, the first one, the first hit, right, that I really had on my own. Um, and I think um, um, for anyone listening that's that's uh that's interested in this sort of this sort of world, right, of of entrepreneurialism, whether you've got a, a, an idea for a device or something other, something else, like it's it's about taking getting taking swings at the plate, right? Getting, getting reps in and taking, taking swings, um, at, at the plate. Um, you know, cause, um, um, I always like to use an analogy when you look at a stat sheet from like, you know, an, a, you know, LeBron James game or, or something like that, or Steph Curry, you know, you never see them going like six for nine, you know, from the floor, it's always like 15 of 30 or something like that. Right. They just, they take a lot of shots. And so that's another, I think another, another important kind of lesson learned for me over the years in the world of startups is you got to, you got to take a lot of shots, take a lot of swings. So as you look back at <clears throat> Juve, um, what would you say were the key components that acted as catalyst 
to you converting a zero to $20 million project. Right. Well, I, I think when most people think of direct to consumer businesses, they think of like, you know, paid ads on Facebook and Instagram and, and, and search on, on Google, but that's not actually how we grew the business. In fact, um, we grew the business almost on, on entirely on the backs of influencers, um, health and wellness influencers, people in the, the longevity space. And so some of these folks are like Ben Greenfield, uh, Dave Asprey, who's the founder of Bulletproof Coffee. He was really popular uh, back in the day. Ben was sort of, I like to call him kind of, he, he took the baton from Tim Ferriss, right? Early on when Tim was really more into to, to biohacking. Um, you know, and that, that, that led to, you know, interacting with people like Rick Rubin and getting, getting uh, devices into the kind of the, the professional sports um, arena. And, um, you know, one thing kind of, you know, working sl slowly up, up the chain, one thing, um, one thing led, led to another. And I've got some, some pretty, pretty fun stories around that, but this concept of influencer marketing, if you will, um, was really kind of a big aha for me, uh, coming out of that experience is, and, and that was, um, that was a big learning too, is it was, it was always amazing looking back how much influence some of these people have, right. There's a reason, you know, we, we joked around about Joe Rogan earlier before we hit the record button, but he's got a tremendous amount of influence, right? Um, and uh, that drives a tremendous amount of behavior. Um, and so that was that was a big big lesson learned for me, kind of coming out of the, the Jew experience. Do, do you think there's a role in in this in a way is is um, is useful for me because I am building Hope Vascular and Podiatry, right? I left corporate America or the hospital corporations and I'm starting my own thing. And then also through the Life of Flow podcast, when we think about and when we've had these discussions behind the scenes, we talk about the power of influencers. But right when you now, of course, back in the days, you probably had a very minute group of people that you could possibly reach. And now it's almost like it's almost like a derogatory thing, right? It's like, oh my God, influencers in the wild, right? And so mm -hmm. you have this gamut yeah. of people. So do you think, A, within influencers, there's subclasses of, of influencers for different types? And, and more specifically, what sort of influencer in healthcare do you believe is, is the prime influencer uh, entity that one should, A, find, B, support, see polish and and somehow feed these opportunities to yeah and, and there, there's certainly to answer your first question um there's certainly uh sort of levels or degrees of influencers right because for anyone listening that listening to this you're probably thinking wait a second this guy's talking about like influencers on instagram that are like doing selfies at the at the whole foods you know what i mean um no, i'm not i'm not talking about that 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 world i mean i am to a certain extent but um but uh i i i love this concept of influencing for good Right. Um, and so I, I think a lot, there's a lot of, you know, physicians or physicians and clinicians that, that listen to the life flow podcast. And I, I would, I would, I would, I would, uh, the argument I would make to you listening is that don't view that word as derogatory because you have a lot of influence and you can use that influence for good, um, in a very, very, very positive way. Um, and so when I say, when I talk about influencers, I, I think that's, it's best to kind of fr frame it up around, around that, but also don't be afraid of that as well, kind of, kind of lean, lean into that because you do have uh, a remarkable, amount, a, a remarkable amount of influence. And that was one of the key things that I realized coming out of that juve experience is that you know, the, be the best influencers, quote unquote influencers that we worked with were very, very thoughtful. They were very well read. They understood exactly, you know, they, they understood the, the domain really, really well. And because of that, they, they, they had an audience that really, really listened to them. Were they physicians? What they, what they had to say. Were they specifically physicians or no? Uh, somewhere, somewhere, you know, you have uh, physicians like Dr. Peter Atia, who's pretty well known. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, Andrew Huberman, although he wasn't as popular, you know, back, back in the day, um, he's not a physician, he's, I guess, a PhD, but, um, but yeah, so, somewhere, but others were just very, um, um, very into that, the lo lo longevity space. Ben Greenfield is, is another one. He's not a physician. I think he maybe has a master's in science, but he's extremely well read. Right. And so he has a very loyal audience that listens to almost every word he says because uh, because he goes deep right on a subject and brings them very, you know, very good, uh, you know, uh, intelligent information that they can use and adapt and apply to their own their own lives. And so um, so so, yeah, the, working with the right influencers was extremely helpful from a from a business uh, perspective. And I think there's a lot of uh, ways that that applies right to to the world that. That, I, that that I'm in now, right? Which is kind of more traditional med tech. But I think um, I think 
uh, in addition to that, there's a lot of physicians that I run into that could probably use their influence in a lot of different ways, right? And you guys, you guys are a perfect example with this podcast, right? I mean, I don't know of, I don't know of any other vascular surgeons maybe that have a podcast and are committed to like producing content like this, but there's a ton of value that you're, you're delivering right to an audience that, it, you know, will, will trust, uh, and, and begin to kind of intimately know, know you guys, you know, personally, you know, through the, through the audible word. And so I think that's a, that's a really, really good thing. And I think that's a kind of an untapped, untapped, uh, kind of, uh, concept, right. In the world of, uh, in the, in the, in, in this, in this kind of world that we operate in. Yeah. And going back to the influencers, isn't like, keynote speakers that isn't you know big you know big medical device pd medtronic boston has been doing that forever it's just in a stage in a conference they paid for some lunch and they put somebody in there to talk about their, their data same exact thing same exact thing T totally yeah i mean it's they're just, often referred they, to this as has KOL, more leverage. Right? Key, key opinion leaders yeah Th this yeah. has way more leverage because that you know requires physical time physical space this doesn't yeah, exactly. And and I and I, I would say that yeah, this this concept has been around for quite some time, right? Um, you know, when I, I say influencers, someone that's been spent their career in med tech would say, Well, you're talking about KOLs, right? Um yes, to a certain extent, but a lot of a lot of um what I think a lot the, the, the big missing component is a lot of people think uh think of influence as being on podium, right? And there to, I'm not dismissing that. There's a there's obviously a a lot of a lot of uh great information that you can disseminate. But that's like a that's a one time thing, right? Once a year at this conference, you're going to speak on podium maybe a couple times. There, there's so much more domain expertise that you have with everything that you're you're seeing uh, and the, the patient interaction on a, on a on a weekly basis. That I'm sure a lot of other physicians would be like, well, what what do you what do you do when this happens, or what do you do when that happens, or uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot more uh, you know um, uh, experiences, right. That you can, uh, you can, you can disseminate versus just a, a one or one, 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 one time kind of podium talk, if you will. Plus it all also appeases to the fact that the next generations are all taking their information in a very different way. Yeah. You know, before you would have these meetings with thousands of people in auditoriums, I remember being in auditoriums where you couldn't even sit. And now it's actually rare to go to a meeting and find an auditorium that's full. Yeah, because there's so much access to information that comes in different ways, uh, and so I would agree um, that that I think us three, you started this way way earlier. Uh, how long have you been? And it could be a great pivot to to the other thing that Scott does, uh, because I want to understand through your podcasting career, uh, you are the founder and the host alone of the MedSider uh, podcast. And I was surprised. I'm sorry. I don't want to be insulting. <laughs> I was surprised it's been around for a long time. And I can't tell you in the last year how many times I have Googled or seeked information about specifically what you talk. And somehow I just never came across this, this one unique, excellent place uh, where what you do is on a on a regular basis bring med tech leaders to talk about their journeys and and what's worked with them and what hasn't worked with you, which in a way I think has been an absolute encyclopedia for you throughout the years leading up to this current role as a CEO for a med tech company, which we'll get to. But tell me about why you start the podcast. And tell me even more, how bad was it at the beginning? Because <laughs> I I was just telling Lucas on the way here, I was like, man, I hate listening to me myself, right? Like the first yeah. few times I either ramble, I, my wife says, you're such a mansplainer. You've and always done that. Dude. I do, but I need to stop. <laughs> well, I, have you, have you realized to that today I've been like pulling back myself a little bit more. Uh, and then also, you know, we, we, I said I was going to sober up for this one because you shouldn't be drinking when you do these. Uh, you, you lose a little bit of your control. S speak for yourself. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> uh, the king of uh, preparedness over here. Um, he's going to prepare a ton of drinks. <laughs> but anyway, back to the question. So when did you start? How did it start? And how bad did you suck? at it at the beginning. Yeah. Let, let, let me get to MedSider one quick second, but I mentioned back, kind of back to this, this idea of physician influence. I mentioned Andrew Huberman, right? Just, just a, a few minutes ago, but he, he's this guy that's like 
taken off. I mean, he's so, so popular now in kind of this biohacking longevity space. And, um, you know, he, 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 he basically, he started off with podcasts, right. And, and then that led to like him really, you know, taking clips of that podcast and posting on Instagram. And now he has massive, massive Instagram following, et cetera, but he's influencing for good in a, in a, in a, reasonably unique way, right? At least unique to probably the academics that he's around at, at Stanford, as an example, right? So there's a lot of different ways that you can disseminate information and have have influence. Um, you know, but like, like, that's why, you know, I'm a big fan of what you guys are doing is like, you know, start with a podcast and kind of see see where it goes, you know, and that that's sort of what I, I you know, I did with with MedSider just to kind of circle back around to your, your question. Um, Miguel, I started that the show, gosh, back in 2009. Um, because I was, I was a big podcast listener back then. This was, this was when, you know, the only app on the, on your, the only podcast app on your phone was the Apple podcast app, right? There, Spotify wasn't around then. And, you know, it was, it was, uh, it was, it was, uh, kind of a new, a new format. I was super into it though. Um, and, uh, the only, there, there was a bunch of startup podcasts that I listened to back in the day, but there was nothing on med tech. And I was around all of these devices, these cool new devices that were being used. I saw them and I was like, how, where do these things come from? You know, like how did this, how, how you know, this vascular surgeon and this interventional cardiologist is using this new, this new tool. Like where did it come from? What's the story behind it? And there's nothing available. So I was like, well, I, I kind of, I want to scratch my own itch here and I, I'll just do it then. Right. So I started, I started recording uh, podcasts, uh, and, um, um, the, the content was like super like it, it ebbed and flowed, right. Um, based on kind of what, what I, what I had on my plate. Um, so there'd be, there'd be six months where I'd be really consistent with the content. And then, you know, six months would go by and it was like, I'd record just a couple, a couple podcasts. But at the end of the day, I kept, I kept doing it because I was just naturally curious. Um, and, um, I was awful at first for sure. Uh, <laughs> no doubt. Um, I still don't listen to a lot of my own, my own uh, shows every now and then I, I do, uh, if I, if it was like a particular interesting conversation, but I, a lot of times I don't, I don't really listen cause I don't, I don't necessarily like to hear my own voice, but, but yeah, it's definitely a craft that you kind of hone, uh, by just doing it, you know, doing it a lot. Um, you just get better. It's just like any, any other skill set. Um, but, but one of the, one of the reasons that I kept doing it is, um, is one, I was just, again, curious, you know, naturally curious about the content. So that was, that was one thing that kind of continued to fuel the fire. And then secondarily podcasts, as you guys know, have really, has really blown up right over the past, you know, five, five years or so. And I, and I saw it as a medium that could ultimately potentially become valuable, you know, for, for me personally. Um, I didn't know exactly what that looked like. Um, still don't know entirely. I mean, it's certainly synergistic to what I'm doing now. Um, but I don't, it, it's not something I've had like a business model around from the get go. Right. So it was a combination of you know, being naturally curious about this, this subject matter, but also uh, uh, seeing the value that a lot of other podcasts have and, and thinking that, you know, th there, there probably would be some, some value ultimately, you know, and continuing to kind of build this thing up. You know, one of the things that I like the most about your pod is actual, the detail information on, on the pod. I don't, I don't know how, which, which, which platform do you upload to? Do you use Spotify as your main no, I use, I use, I use, I host on Transistor, um, and then it automatically syndicates to, you know, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, et cetera. But I mean, 98% of my listens come from Apple Podcasts. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Well, we're hosting on Spotify, right? Because yeah, we wanted the video. Podcasters, which was Anchor. Mm. It was called Anchor, and now it's Spotify for podcasters because yeah. we wanted video. And have video on your all right. Yeah. Ali, our producer saying you guys were insistent on video and that was probably the better one. And so, but, but you know what I do is I, 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 I am curious, of course, now more than ever and obviously hypercritical. So I'll go in and I'll read and I'll like find either typos or things or things that I didn't like. And I'm like, you know, being mean and aggressive and passive aggressive towards Ali in the middle of the <laughs> night when doctors get home and do all these things. It's so funny because, you know, they live a completely different life yeah. from us. And I'm like, hey, 7 a.m. meeting works for everybody. And I've got all these millennials like, what the fuck? Yeah, man? I know. Like, what are you Outside, doing? I trying to what not are you wake everyone to us, up. Right. But I mean, uh, it's work and they've been great. Ali, we love you. But um, to say the descriptors of your podcast are second and like, like I have not seen one that good. Who puts that effort into that? Because, because it's a ton of information, it's links, it's hyperlinks, it's followers, like it's very well and thought out. Well, thank, thank you for that. Uh, that's definitely been uh, an ever evolving process, right? But um, I've got a team um, of, of writers um, that, I, that I pay for. I mean, this is an endeavor that I, I, I fund myself, but I've got a team of writers that, um, that will listen to the, to the show. Um, and then, uh, come up with about a 3000 word write-up 
um, that kind of summarizes the the learnings. And that that was one thing, again, kind of in the, under, under the skies of kind of scratching my own itch. A lot of times I would listen to a podcast and be like, I don't want to re-listen to it, but can I go back and look at the show notes? But a lot of times the show notes are just bullet points. And you know, there's not much substance there. It's like, can I get a little bit more than that? And so that was one of the the ideas that I had that that, that I, I kind of wanted to see. And so I just started doing it. And I think it's really been been popular but it also, I, I think, helps you know further grow the show too because it's unique, and, and a lot of a lot of uh, podcasters don't um, don't don't uh, I guess commit to that type of effort because it is it is work, right? But uh, but I think it's also you know it delivers a lot of value too uh, as well at the same at the same time. But uh, but yeah, um, I, I think uh, there, there's a number of different ways uh, that I could repurpose the content uh, as well. Uh, it's just kind of a, a function of of, of, of time and uh, and resources. <laughs> uh, um, but uh, you know that's a Maybe offline, we'll talk about some other ideas, how you guys could uh, could repurpose some of this too, if, if not Ali. If Ali's probably already brought some of these ideas to the table. <laughs> how do you leverage your podcast for your other ventures? So, you know, um, how how is it helpful for your other kind of probably more bigger projects or, or primary projects? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, 95% of my time, if not more, you know, I mean, I, def- I certainly spend more than 40 hours a week on, on Fastwave, right? But if you look at kind of the pie of where I spend my my, my time um, is on Fastwave, right? Um, that's uh, a significant a significant commit- commitment. It's a really, it's really fun, fun company and, and where I think we're well, well positioned um, um, and making, making a lot of really good progress. But um, it's, it's helpful. Um, for, for fast wave, uh, really because of two, two things, right? I mean, the, the main job I think of any startup CEO is, is keeping money in the bank. Um, number one, <laughs> and then, and then two, uh, building out a team, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be a team of, of, uh, full-time employees, but it could be a team of, of consultants, et cetera. And, um, interviewing hundreds of other startup founders and CEOs. Now I, I have a, a pretty significant network of people that I can just, if I've got a question, I can ping them right um, right away, like um, and 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 they'll and I'll get a response back um, in, immediately. Um, that's also helped me to build out like a, a network of, of of regulatory folks, clinical folks, et cetera, that have a bias towards startups. So I, I can I can tap into kind of a unique a unique community of people that like want that, that know how startups work, right? Um, in in, in med tech, um, and then from a capital perspective, uh, you know, raising capital is probably the the, the one of the most significant challenges I think for any 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 startup CEO, especially in med tech, it's kind of like playing the game on hard mode. Um, and then you you lay you put, you layer that up against the, the current backdrop of the the fundraising environment. It's extremely challenging. Um, so one of the big things is just ra- raising awareness for 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 the project that I'm working on, right? And by recording podcasts, producing content, writing op eds for Forbes, for MD and DI, various outlets, like that helps raise the level of awareness kind of within the broader community for for what we're trying to build at Fastwave. Can, can we transition into Fastwave? Can, can you give us a little of the backdrop? How did you come into the project? Is this something that you kind of started from the beginning? Did you did somebody bring you in? How, how did that start? Yeah, well, what, what, it, 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 was, it was spun out of um, uh, a kind of a venture studio. I like to call it that because it probably resembles more of a venture studio that I'm involved with called, called Big Sky Biomedical. Um, and a lot of the a lot of the projects that we work on come from physicians, right? So we have kind of a, uni- a unique model around. Hey, you've you, Dr. Smith has this great idea. How do we actually bring this to to life? Um, and so it was kind of a project that spun out of that. Fastwave didn't necessarily come from a physician per se, but we spun it out of that venture studio. Um, uh, actually started working on it as a as a as a quote unquote project back in mid 2020. Um, and decided to pursue it with more rigor uh, because of a, a couple things. One is that we expected intravascular lithotripsy or IVL uh, to continue to be uh, uh, utilized on, on a greater basis. I think which is which is uh, um, uh, which is you know held held, held uh, or come to fruition for sure um, in large part because of uh, shockwaves, shockwave medicals, um, uh, great execution. Um, but in addition, when the USPTO uh, ruled almost overwhelmingly um, in favor of um, a company called CSI, their, their IPR um, efforts to invalidate a lot of key patents that Shockwave had, we thought that was a classic why now moment for us to get to, to pursue the project with more rigor. And so we started working on it as, as a team in the back half of 2020, spun the company out as a Delaware C-Corp, a standalone Delaware C-Corp in, in early 21. And then pursued a, a, a Series A round of a round of capital and closed on that about six months later. Because um, up until that point, we didn't raise any any seed money. We'd, we'd funded it entirely by by ourselves. Um, and so went to went straight to a Series A, closed that in August of 21, 
And that was the first major infusion of capital into the, into the company, uh, which allowed us to kind of begin to build out the, the broader team and really kind of hit the gas pedal on our development efforts. And so, um, you know, uh, now we're, you know, recording this in Q4 of 23 and, uh, you know, have been able to come up, you know, build a, build a couple different uh, I, I, IVL systems that we feel really good about, you know, moving forward. And uh, I think the company's, company's pretty, pretty well, well positioned for our, our clinical efforts on the near horizon. You flew by the, the, the court decision uh, about CSI. Can you dive into that a little bit more? And how did that background, legal background say, okay, this is the moment? Yeah, I, I think, um, yeah, so that, that's a great question. So I think any, any, any startup, I think when you, when you look back at kind of why, why it took off or why it actually became a thing, there's, there's usually a, like a, a why now moment. Like why, why now? Why, why, should, why should investors deploy capital into this thing? Why should, uh, why should a group of people come together to work on it, et cetera? There's always sort of a why, a why now moment. And if, if the USPTO hadn't ruled almost overwhelmingly in CSI's favor, we probably wouldn't have, uh, have ever worked on the project. And what I mean by that, just to, get, to be a little bit more pragmatic, is CSI, Cardiovascular Systems, they were recently acquired by Abbott, they, um, they uh, initiated what's called an IPR um, effort to invalidate um, Shockwave's uh, three key patents. And this is all in the public domain, uh, so I'm not, I'm not sharing anything that's not public. But um, um, they were extremely successful. Um, I think uh, when that team at CSI um, led that or started that initiative. I think a lot of people thought they were crazy. Um, and, you know, probably myself included, but they ended up, you know, really winning pretty, pretty big. Um, and so we, we were following that and thought, well, that, 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 this is interesting. And it's even more interesting when the USPTO ruled, uh, the way they did, uh, in such, in such quick fashion. And so we thought, we thought there's probably a little bit more room to operate than I think most people, most people realize, um, with respect to IP. And so that's, that's one of the reasons we decided to, to kind of go a lot, a lot deeper and, and choose this project versus others. Was this not, not to dive too do deep into this, into this, but was this because CSI had previously put in some IP regarding, uh, lithothripsy? No, no. So I, I, IPR, and I, I had never, I didn't even know what the term IPR was right before, before this, uh, just, just to kind of level, level set on that. But it, it's a, it's a, it's a process to basically invalidate, uh, uh, a company's patents. Um, in, in essence, if I had to kind of, um, sort of try, try to attempt to dumb, dumb it down, I'm not, I'm certainly not an IP attorney by any stretch of the imagination, but you're basically appealing to the USPTO to say, these patents that have been granted, they're not valid because there's all of this uh, existing art in the public domain that predates all of the IP. And so that's kind of the argument that you're making to the USPTO. And, and surprisingly, the US, USPTO agreed almost overwhelmingly and said, yeah, we, we agree. There's a lot of, there's a lot of art in the public domain that predates all of Shockwave's patents. So like these three ca- key patents that were, that were invalidated. Yep. We, we, we believe and, and accept your argument and they were invalidated. You would think CSI was planning on coming up with an IVL product because why would you go through the expenditure of doing that if you didn't execute on it? Yeah, and I think I think they they wanted to, right? Um, that was kind of their plan about about their efforts. I don't know how far along they are um, now now that they're kind of under the under the Abbott umbrella, but I think that was sort of one of the underlying intentions of them doing this is they wanted to to get in the in, into the space and probably you know sort of for lack of a better description, kind of clear the clear the pathway uh, a, a little bit, right, to, to enter. So we shouldn't be surprised if you sell to Abbott at some point in the next 24 months. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers this, crossed. This topic is, is, quite, is, quite, is quite interesting, though, because I know you had, you had Dr. Peter Schneider on, on the show, which was a really, really great interview, I think, I don't know, a month ago-ish or yeah. something like that. And um, obviously, very, very successful entrepreneur, uh, successful physician in his own right, of course. Um, but you know, you touched on IP previously, and that's just you know something to keep in mind. Um, you know, for anyone else that's that's uh, that's working on projects, is that just because you have a patent uh, doesn't necessarily mean it's you know an easy road, or all the you know all the all the uh, the dominoes are going to fall after that. That's certainly certainly not the case. <laughs> it just adds to the feeling of overwhelmed, you know, being overwhelmed by the amount of things you need to learn. Because you know how much effort you have to put in to, to bring a project and then you're like, okay, I have this IP, but now you have the uncertainty of like, oh, someone might come like for some reason, I have no idea, you know, out of left field and then validate my patent and then poof, goes away. It's crazy. <laughs> One of the things I, I like your opinion on this, you're main, mentioning Peter and I, I think Peter is is a great guy, but he's also very smart politically and very politically correct so 
I try to tease, you know, kind yeah. of to throw some treats in and see how much I would get out of him. But he was very <laughs> uh, shifty and very smart and not uh, addressing it. But I wanted him and, and now you to give me a comment on the complicated position that we as physicians get ourselves in when we are working with companies at a startup level being that, to your point previously, we have this trust in the community uh, and we can exert our influence mm -hmm. in a way, right? And so how do you maneuver conflict of interest in the setting of entrepreneurship when there are certainly more physicians nowadays than before interested in coming up with technology and ideas and we have a lot of young physicians that come from engineering backgrounds. And so I see this more and more, but it seems like regulatory pathways change a lot, are very shifty. And right now we're, we're under a pretty Drakarian, I think, phase where I know phenomenal speakers that have been asked to not speak because of some relationship. So you know, people that have the most experience on a particular device cannot even have a comment. So Um, in, in this uh, you know, short career with, with your company, have you noted that? Because I know how intimately related FastWave is with physicians, uh, both as investors and as strategics. What's your take on this and how, how should we maneuver this regulatory hassle? Yeah, no, it, it, that's, it's, it's a great topic. Um, and um, I'll may, maybe try to offer some things from, from, from my perspective. Um, on how, how, how to navigate this because it, it's very relevant to what we're doing at Fastway. We just closed on a round of financing fairly recently and it was a significant amount of capital and the overwhelming majority of it came from physicians, which is an, I mean, we, we feel incredibly grateful for that, right? Because it's, you know, to have the support of domain experts that are saying, I like that technology. There needs to be another player. You know, I'm, I'm investing my own, my own capital, my own money into the, into that, into that project. I mean, that's a, that's a amazing testament and feel incredibly grateful for that. Um, But I, I think kind of to circle back around to your question, um, Miguel, and maybe get to the heart of it is, I actually think it's a good thing. Uh, I fundamentally think it's a good thing for physicians to collaborate with, uh, uh, with you know, um, in industry in this type of capacity. Um, but and and it, and it could go one of two ways, right? If you're if if you have sort of the the wrong players, right? Um, then I think it leads to leads to um, people, you know, a lot of skept skepticism. But if you're working with the right people, right? Uh, um, Peter Schneider, since we brought him up, is a great example. He knows he knows how to um, sort of divide the worlds, right? And he's not going to when when someone, wh whether it's a venture capitalist or a strategic company that's interested in the company, is going to ask him about uh, a particular um, um, uh, you know product or system or whatever or device. He's he's not afraid to disclose that and be transparent, and I think that's that's the key because um, I think we've all been to to, to conferences where uh, a physician will get on podium and start their talk, and they they rattle off a bunch of disclosures as it happens so fast, and the slide is like five seconds, and it's like what what like <laughs> what like what's your involvement in, in in this or this this product? But I think if you just address it up, uh, up front in a more genuine and transparent way, it's 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 relatively easy to to solve for, right? Because everyone physicians and people on the industry side, they, they know how all of this works, right? The two, two parties have to come together. Like, I mean, industry is not going to function without collaboration with physicians, you know, and you guys aren't going to get new technology or devices to use without, you know, a group of people, investors, business folks coming together to actually build it, you know? Um, and so the two have to collaborate together, but I think the, the key is just transparency, right. And being honest about kind of, you know, uh, The, uh, the particular you know company or, or startup or whatever that you're involved with does that does that make sense yeah I'm gonna go off on a tangent here you said you <laughs> as always as always um, you said you just went through a round of financing and a lot of them were physicians where do physicians that don't know you or don't know about your company like go to find information about these opportunities so you have your IVL super hot topic you know competitor to shockwave that's kind of a no-brainer if you have the data to go into. Where do I find out about that? And because I feel like I missed that. Yeah. I, I wish there was a better, I wish there was almost like an angel list, right? Or yeah. something like that for crowdfunding. For, no. There you know, should be these, uh, these deals. I think um, there should be a thing called MD crowdfunding. 
Yeah. Like just op- empty. Think about an open platform. How needed is it that there could be an empty crowdfunding platform where new devices get put out there? And as a physician, you get to analyze it. And you're the only thing is obviously you're, you're going to play with less. But I, I'm sorry to interrupt. So it's like, okay, brilliant idea. Let's yeah. build this other company for MD crowdfunding. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's never been easier actually to actually execute against that idea because of the new the new regulations um, in investing in, in, in startups. You know, um, WeFunder is a good platform as, as an example. And they've got some device and life science companies on that, on that platform. But this idea of raising money from a community uh, it's really, really kind of pick, picking up steam. You know, one of the companies that I saw do it really well was uh, in, the, I guess, in the life sciences space was a company called Levels Health. Uh, and they were the first company to take a CGM um, and basically put a put an, an app, a wrapper around that to make it very easy for a consumer that doesn't have diabetes, but just wants to kind of measure their, you know, how they respond, um, uh, what their insulin response is to certain food. They were kind of the first ones to do that had a huge waiting list and ended up raising money uh, from their, from their, from I think $5 million, uh, I believe specifically around that number from their community. So I think this idea of having, you know, a, a Kickstarter ish type of platform, a WeFunder type of platform specific for, for devices, I think can, could make a lot of sense, but you know, Lucas, you raise a good point. I think um, there isn't a really good, there isn't like a one, one stop shop to kind of go find, you know, new or interesting deals um, to, to potentially invest in. Um, usually it's just word of mouth, right. You know, knowing that, Oh, so and so does a lot of you know med tech investing, or this person in industry. You know, I'll give a shout out to a guy like Gary McCord, um, who is a, an exceptional uh, business person, but is just you know has the Midas touch when it comes to you know early stage private companies. And so a lot of people that know Gary know that hey, if he, you know, if if he thinks it's good to to kind of invest in, a lot of people will just you know um, will, will will trust him because he has such an amazing track record. Um, and so I think. Uh, you know, there's a lot of offline kind of word of mouth, right, uh, in terms of trying to find and discover these types of uh, these types of uh, uh, opportunities. So, what's next uh, here uh, for for Fastwave? Where are you guys at, and and what should we be expecting here in the next uh, few quarters? Yeah, um, exciting times for sure. We're just on the precipice of uh, of starting uh, clinical work, um, so really excited about about uh, uh, what that looks like. Um, the we'll, we'll we'll commence on that in early uh uh early uh, early next year um and they'll that will accelerate into um you know p- uh, pivotal trials um as, as well um for uh, for regulatory clearance and, and approval um but we've been we've been public about this we're working on multiple ivl systems right so not so not just one um and so we're we're really excited about both um and uh you know one's probably a little bit more of a next gen type of type of platform um, but but super excited about about the opportunity there. Are you looking for peripheral, coronary, or both? Both. Okay. So your catheters currently can potentially do both, or are you at the stage where you only have sizes for certain indication? Um, I guess without without, without being mindful of <laughs> what if it was. that's if that's yeah. a question that could be spoken. I don't know. Yeah. I, maybe I'm overstepping. I don't We're know. Working on on balloon catheters for for both. Uh, both applications, right? So, uh, yep, sizes and lengths for peripheral and, and coronary. What What do you think it is? What What's the opportunities you see in IVL as compared to? Like, where Where do you place it? What's it competing against? Is it competing against POVA? Is it competing against atherectomy? Um, and why do you think it has an advantage? Because, to be honest, obviously, if there's recalcitrant plaque, um, IVL is a good choice. But in my mind, saying an SFA is not my go-to, um, I might be completely wrong about that. Um, but the paradigm hasn't shifted in my mind where I'm like, okay, IV is also the forefront of my treatment paradigm. Um, so I know it's extremely safe as far as embolization rates and, and the such and, and increasing compliance, um, but I find the limited length of the catheters a limiting factor uh, with the current uh, catheters that we have so i think that might be a big hurdle uh, but yeah wh- where do you see it where do you think you have the advantage and how are you going to convince me to change what i do yeah um that's it's a it's a really good point you you, you touched on a number of, of of challenges right with with the the current ivl technology on the market and this is not this is not to um undermine what Shockwave has done. They've done an exceptional job kind of creating, you know, making this technology available. I think it's definitely taken off more so in the coronaries, right? You can see that with, with uh, you know, uh, with their publicly reported revenue. 
Uh, and so in, in the coronaries, it's, I, I think it's, it's definitely, um, a more, um, it's definitely more of a, a default part of a, of, of an algorithm in the, in the coronaries for, in terms of vessel, vessel prep, um, you know, before a, a DES is, is, is implanted, uh, on the, on the, uh, you know, for peripheral applications, there's a lot more constraints though, right. Length of balloon being, being one of the most significant ones. Um, and I think until that challenge is solved, which I think, um, our next gen system, I think will, will possibly, possibly, uh, do that. Until that that challenge is solved, it's going to be you know quite challenging to use on any sort of consistent basis in the periphery. Um, I think below the knee applications for really for really complex diffuse disease, I think there's a lot of opportunity there as well. But length length of balloon uh, is certainly a, a a major major challenge for uh, for peripheral applications. I might be wrong on this, but Shockwave doesn't have a CBT code, yeah. right? So are you guys, you know, I agree with the below the knee uh, problem. And I think if you know if you have a hundred uh, millimeter balloon, I think that would be great. But it's a very expensive catheter that doesn't get paid for. <laughs> so, uh, do you guys have you guys thought about that? How are you uh, pr- approaching that? Yeah, yeah. Are you talking about reimbursement, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. For for sure. That that's another obviously on the business side. You know, um, that is definitely another another major challenge, right? Because if you if you're if you're operating an OBL. Um, or an, an ASC, you, like you, you can't, you can't lose money. I mean, then your business will, will quickly, I mean, there will, will there'll be, there'll, there'll be no hope, you know, vascular as an example, right. If you're, if you're losing money on every, every case. So I think that's, that's certainly a major challenge. I don't really have other than time, right. I think with time, uh, we'll see positive changes on the reimbursement side. Uh, we certainly seen that on the coronaries, right. Um, I think, uh, there's a, there's a new, uh, DRG code for inpatient, uh, inpatients, um, um, that was recently recently announced. That's a that's a major improvement. I think that was the first new DRG in like twenty, close to twenty years, something like that. And so, I think I'm hopeful, right? That we'll I'll put it that way. I'm hopeful that we'll we'll see the same type of progress on the uh, on the for peripheral applications. It'll be interesting as 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 some other reimbursement pathways and and tools are under fire. Mm-hmm. Um, Potentially by the lack of data. Yeah. Um, if data does pile up to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that there is a place for IVL, um, I would not be surprised at all. Is as some codes kind of degrade in the reimbursement that there is a compensation to allowing physicians to treat some of these more complex things because there there are tools that we use on a daily basis. That again to the Twitterati out there that, that, that <laughs> hate it, yes, are not based on some huge amount of of data. But for those of us that do cases, we know that certain calcium, yeah. if you don't use an atherectomy device to try to modulate that plaque, you yeah. are going to do nothing. You're yeah. going to have an underexpanded stent. Yeah. You're going to have severe restenosis. That patient's going to be back. And yes, understood. We need more data, but it's not there. It doesn't mean that the tools should just poof. And like get out of our hands as they're starting to get at this point by the endless denials that we're all getting and facing into. But anyway, I I do. I think that that's where your advantage comes in because your safety profile of IVL. Mm-hmm. If you have the same safety profile of shockwave, which you should based on your mechanism of action, then you'll have a competitive advantage. Because I don't worry when I put a shockwave down into an SFA that I'm going to trash everything. And you know, unless it's obviously that there's thrombus, right? Well, but, I, I, but if I put some other devices, I'm like, you know, like this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for, yeah, for our listeners, do not look at the video. Um, Scott, I would, I would advise you, um, and here, here's one of the cool things in this show is you get to meet all these people, mm-hmm. but then that network can become a web, right? Yeah. Um, I'll give you offline and I'll connect you with Trisha Roy. And this... Uh, Vascular surgeon is in Houston, and she's doing some tremendous work. Uh, may I, maybe I mentioned this when when we met. I, I, li- I li- she, you had her on the show. I think I listened to the podcast. The, okay. she, the imaging. She's doing like a lot of like killer bleeding edge stuff in imaging, right? Well, here's here's where I think would be really interesting, and I don't think that this is overly costly, but you can do a lot of validation on different plaque morphology in ex vivo amputated limbs of patients that unfortunately have lost the limb-saving fight. And so in order 
to convert that into a win um, for society. These people donate their legs. And then Trish comes and scans him with a seven Tesla MRI and then runs devices through these arteries and then scans them again so that you can actually see the effect that right now we either make up on angiogram because you can't see it, or we try to sort of squint our eyes and say that on IVAS we see the spickle micro fragments <laughs> after you run a specific, uh, you know, device. But this is a, a true opportunity in us in a in a com company at your stage to potentially put some meat on the bone and say, hey, here is the true effect. Yeah. Here is why a long tibial because here's the other thing is all plaque is different. Right. Mm -hmm. And sometimes within the same vessel, there's plaque that's completely different, proximally and distally, and some yeah. may be soft and some may be chronic clot and all these high level complexities. But the fact of the matter is that if you can prove beyond the reasonable doubt that this particular device modulates calcium in certain areas and you add that data and then you come and you find the clinical data into your point and then you add the IDE and you have this other company that's kind of trailblazed and picked up and some headwinds in, in reimbursement, I, I think you have a, a killer opportunity uh, to, to add in the areas where this one company, the trailblaze, didn't necessarily add mm -hmm. and how that's going to give you that competitive advantage, uh, which is already there based on a free market, right? If anybody buys you and you got two cars, you decide which one you like the most. But how cool would it be that you get the chance to maybe add more to the story on the front end yeah. that'll deliver a stronger yeah. back end? Yeah, no, I, I love I love that, and I, I'd love an intro to to uh, uh, to, to Trisha. Uh, I think that'd be phenomenal to kind of to kind of work with her in that capacity. And on that note, Miguel, one of the interesting things about electric based IVL, right, which is shockwave, um, is because of that energy source, it's it's um it doesn't allow you to to tune the cavitation bubble uh, with 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 a great degree, right? It's it's almost like you're you're kind of um I don't know, it, it's a it's a it, it, there's not a lot, a lot of precision there. I'll, I'll put it that way. But there, there's a lot of other energy sources, right, that do allow you to modify the acoustic field. Um, and and I think that could have a lot of interesting ramifications, right? If you're able to use a seven Tesla MRI to figure out, okay, what's the best, what 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 is the ideal acoustic field, right, to uh, effectively modify plaque um, uh, consistently, right, um, uh, in in the majority of use cases across the board. That's, That's awesome. Super, That's super interesting. Well, Scott, look, um, I told you we'd steal an hour. I think it's been an hour and a few minutes. It's one of the cool things about this. Sometimes you just fly and, and you realize how long you've been going. There's there's no true perfect podcast time. It just is what it is. It is what it is. <laughs> but I want to be respectful of your time uh, and your work. Thank you very much for coming, for being here with us. It's been awesome. Uh, inspiring in so many ways. And uh, hopefully we can have you later on when you've progressed a little bit more on on this awesome project and you can tell us a little bit more yeah, when you're when you sell and you're like off in the mediterranean like with a with a linen shirt he already sold you <laughs> and made it done money. come on yeah, man. Well, and he's already you know. in it he you don't he's on yeah. starlink uh, he's, he's up a, in yeah. space yeah he's with elon <laughs> that's right, that's right. Yeah. he's no, he, no, I mean, we didn't ask him where he was enough guys for ha having me on um the uh i mean we, co we covered a lot though we, we talked about in instagram influencers right bright <laughs> bright red lights and you know, how to change, how to tune an acoustic window on an IVL device, right? I mean, it's, but no, no, it's just been fun. I, I, lo I love what you guys are. I, lo I really, really genuinely love what you guys are doing um, for sure. Um, and uh, and uh, hope, hope you continue to, to, to push out these uh, this type of content. Thanks. You want to plug in your podcast? Yeah, yeah, Medsider. It's M E D S I D E R. Medsider dot com is the is the website. Uh, you can just do a search on on uh, on any sort of podcast app, and you'll find it there as well. And then Fastwave Medical is fastwavemedical dot com, uh, just as it sounds. Um, uh, so yeah, those are the the two things that I'm mostly working on these days. Fastwave being you know being the 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 big the big one on the on the plate right now. All right, Scott. Well, thank you very very much from us to you. And how we say it back in my country, pura vida. And we'll be in touch. Gracias. Yeah. Bye. Very good.